Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today um, and for coming down to Winter College. Um, it's really a pleasure to get to talk to this group of people. Um, first of all, if anybody um, can't hear me now um, or at any point during the course of this, please just let me know. Um, I think it's a nice small room, but with the echo, I know it might be a little hard. Um, so I'm Amy Somerville. I'm a professor in the psychology department. This is my fifth year at Miami University, um, and I'm really excited to be a part of Winter College this year. Um, one thing about me as a teacher is that I tend to have a lot of student involvement in my classes. Um, most of my classes, I think that if um, I talked more than my students, I've done something wrong in that hour. Um, so I won't expect you to talk that much today, but please jump in with questions. Um, and I'm certainly hoping we'll have time at the end. But if at any point you want, to, want me to talk about something more, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about regret. Um, and we're going to talk about a number of different aspects of regret. The first is simply talking about what regret is. Then we'll talk about what it is that we regret most in our lives. We'll move on to talking about why it is that we feel regret. We'll talk about some individual differences that make people more or less likely to feel regret. And then we'll talk about some of the consequences of regret. Um, one of the things we'll talk about are some of the downsides of regret, why regret is bad for us. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about why trying to live life without regret may not be the best idea. So, uh, excellent. Um, so, uh, in terms of regret, so I think regret is actually when we've done studies looking at what emotions people say they feel in daily life. Um, and regret is actually the second most common emotion that people mention on a day-to-day -day basis, um, second only to love, actually. Um, and it, we've done other studies where we ask people um, to carry a Palm Pilot with them and we beep them every couple of hours and say, what are you thinking right now? Um, and it turns out a lot of those thoughts are pretty mundane, like, it's cold, when is dinner? Um, but of the several more interesting thoughts, about 10% of those are thoughts that sort of relate to regret. So regret is a really common part of our mental landscape. And scientists define regret as a negative emotion based on an upward counterfactual inference focused on the self. Which is a lot of, <laughs> don't worry, there's no quiz. <laughs> Um, so, so some of these things, right, we actually, uh, <laughs> oh, so, you know, negative emotion, right, regret feels bad. And I think we'd all subjectively say, yes, okay, regret is something that feels bad. The other part I want to focus on right now is the focus on the self piece of this. So, you can think, regret has to involve the sense that I should have done something different. There may be cases where something didn't turn out the way we would have liked, but we don't feel like we were to blame, right? That, you know, perhaps we would say, gosh, you know, if it were 85 and sunny, winter college would be even better this year. Um, but, you know, we don't regret that because none of us can control the weather. Um, if any of you can control the weather, please do better. Um, <laughs> So the, the middle piece here, right, the upward counterfactual inference is the part that gets a little jargony. So a counterfactual thought is simply a thought about what if or what might have been. So comparing reality to some other reality that we could have experienced. Um, so what would I have done today if it had been 85 instead of closer to 70? <laughs> yeah, I, easy answer for you. Um, and we can have two kinds of counterfactual thoughts. One kind of counterfactual thought is an upward counterfactual, so comparing to things that would have been better. So perhaps 85 and sunny is an upward counterfactual for some of us. It would have been nicer today if I could have hung out by the pool. But we can also have downward counterfactuals, comparing ourselves to things that would have been worse. Um, so for those of us coming from Ohio, had we not been in Sanibel today, things would have been worse. Um, right? So counterfactual thoughts have both of these directions of comparison. Um, and it turns out that it's not just the case that upward always makes us feel better and downward makes us 
um, or sorry, upward makes us feel worse and downward makes us feel better. Um, sometimes you can have an upward counterfactual thought that makes you feel inspired and hopeful. Um, one of the big pieces we've studied this is actually in sporting events. Um, if your team is down at halftime by just a little bit, that actually feels better than being the team that's ahead by just a little bit. Um, that because you feel like, okay, we've got the momentum, we're gonna come back in the second half and we can get them, versus if you're only up by one point at the half, oh gosh, are we gonna be able to hang on to this? Um, it feels actually much worse to be up by one than to be down by one at halftime. Um, likewise, sometimes these downward counterfactuals can make us feel bad or feel a sense of dread. Um, so if you think about being in a serious car accident and thinking, you know, oh my gosh, I almost died. Um, that's usually not a reassuring thought for most of us. That <laughs> tends to make us feel pretty bad about things. Um, so, so again, back to um, our definition of counterfactual, right? So it's feeling bad based on an upward counterfactual, which not all upward counterfactuals are. So I'm thinking about how things could have been better. That makes me feel bad. And it's because of something that I personally did. So, when is it that people are going to think counterfactually? So you may have some intuitions about this. You're all willing to talk, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, when do you think you think counterfactually? Yes? At the empty nest. Sorry? When you're at the empty nest. The empty nest? OK, so what, what is it about that that makes you? OK, so it's sort of this moment of kind of big life changes that makes you, you think about this. What else? What are some other times that you've thought about what might have been? Okay, so a big, a big career change. So in general, one, there are a number of places that we tend to think counterfactually. Um, and one of the big things are when we feel like something very nearly could have happened differently. And there are a lot of ways that this can happen. One is that things that are numerically closer. So we're more likely to think about what might have been if, for instance, we miss a flight by five minutes than by an hour. Um, if you've ever been in that unfortunate, you know, racing for the connection and they're closing the door in your face, even though you're equally stuck in the airport as if the flight had left an hour ago, it feels so much worse to know that you almost made it. Um, so this happens in time. Um, it feels much worse to lose a game by two points than ten points, um, you know, if you're a basketball fan. Um, the easier that it is to imagine how things could have turned out differently. So if I have to imagine, well, you know, if my car hadn't broken down and there hadn't been traffic and there hadn't been a line at security, then I would have caught my flight, right? Versus, oh my gosh, I missed it by five minutes and if I just hadn't had that slow person ahead of me in security, I would have made the flight. Right, that that's a, a case where it's just much more likely that I'm going to think about what might have been. Um, and finally, when we do things that are unusual, again, because this makes it easier for us to understand how things could have been different. Um, so one of the classic studies of this um, involved giving people a story about somebody who got in a car accident on the way home from work. Um, and there were two versions of this story. One of the versions was telling people that Mr. Smith um, sometimes leaves work early, on this particular day, he decided to leave work early. He took his usual route home. On the way home, he got in a car accident. Um, and he was thinking about how things could have been different. What kind of thoughts do you think he might have had? And most people, given that scenario, say, well, I'm sure he was thinking if he just left at his usual time, then he wouldn't have been in the accident. Another group of people were given a story where they say, sometimes Mr. Smith takes an unusual route home that's a little more scenic but slower. On this day, he took that route. Um, the same thing, what kind of thoughts do you think he had? People identify the route. Right? Even though in both cases, he could have taken a different route, he could have left at a different time, but the thing that was unusual about what he did is what people latch on to as, oh, this is the thing that could have gone differently. Um, so all of these situations are times when we're going to engage in this counterfactual thinking that's at the heart of regret. So this suggests these are some of the places where we're going to be most likely to feel regret. So that's what regret is. What is it in life that we regret the most? 
Um, and I will put you on the spot and ask you to tell me about what you regret most in life. Um, sometimes I tell people what I study on airplanes and it gets very awkward very fast. Um, so some past research suggests that people have the most research about education. Um, and this is uh, based on sort of a, a lot of different studies that have been done with smaller groups of people that were sort of aggregated together. Um, more recent work where we actually have gone out and done telephone studies um, like they do for political polling to get a representative sample, um, romance is the number one regret that people re report. Um, and it turns out that even across the lifespan, um, it's only when people reach their 70s that this drops out of being one of their, the top three regrets that people report. Um, so take that as you will. Um, family is another major source of regret. Um, family tends to actually come along a little later in life that people start reporting that. Um, and career and education sort of tie for number three. Um, and sort of fairly early on. There are a couple of other life changes that happen. Um, finances, people in their 20s don't really regret their finances, people in their 30s do. Um, health, people don't, it's not really at all in the top five, and then when people get to their 50s, it pops into the top three. Um, so some of the things you, that you might think. Um, so you know, life changes that are happening, um, situations where suddenly you know those cheeseburgers of your 20s are catching up with you. Um, you know that th things are not necessarily doing as well as you might have hoped. Um, it's like Willie Nelson said. What did Willie Nelson say? If I had realized I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> also, probably that. Yeah. Um, so. There are some gender differences in regret. Um, these domains vary a little bit. Women tend to regret um, family and romance more than men do. Men t tend to report regrets about career slightly more than women. Um, one of the issues with those data, though, are we're not really sure why that's the case. Um, so it could be that there are you know, real gender differences here. It could be that. You know, for many, many years, these were sort of the paths that we had available to us, um, and so these were the things that were important. Um, so that's still sort of an open question. Another gender difference that happens um, is specifically within the domain of romance. Um, women are, oh, uh, so that's what I just said. Um, but within the domain of romance, women tend to report more regrets about things they did that they shouldn't have done and men are more likely to report regrets about things they didn't do that they wish they had done. Um, and they're talking about exactly what you think they're talking about. <laughs> um, so that, that's a fairly robust effect. Um, so, so those are the things we regret. But why do we regret these things, right? I've sort of just given you a lot of descriptively, if you ask people, here's what they say. But what's the science behind this? Why are these the things that we regret? Um, and it turns out that there's a little bit of controversy about this, but a new resolution that hopefully brings them together. So one perspective is that we regret the things that we could have done differently in the past, but now we can't fix. So you can think about a regret about your education, right? When I was at Miami, I could have spent more time studying a language. Now it's really going to be hard for me to go out and learn another language. And I just wish I had taken that opportunity when I had it, right? That I had all, this wonderful, all these wonderful resources available to me, and now they're much harder to access. And I blew that chance that I had. A competing theory says, actually, what we regret are the things that continue to matter and be useful to us. So the reason that we feel regret about education, for instance, is because education is a domain that's pretty open. Right? We can always go back to school. We can take advantage of things like Winter College and continue our education informally. So people always have the opportunity to think about how they could be doing better in education. And we'll talk about some of the benefits of regret that make this actually really functional. Um, so if you think about romantic regrets, for instance, that you know, if you are in a relationship and it ends, right? unless you're a 15-year-old girl or Taylor Swift, you think that you'll probably date again in the future. Um, 
No, nobody's a Taylor Swift listener. Okay, um, ask your kids. Um, <laughs> so, um, right, but so thinking about how things could have been better in our last relationship is actually going to make us a better partner in the future, right? Thinking about, gosh, if I had just communicated better, then things would have worked out. Um, you know, if I hadn't been picking people up at biker bars, maybe I would have had somebody who was a little more compatible with me. Um, all of these things are going to help us make better choices in our future relationships. Um, my apologies to any of you who met your lovely spouses at biker bars. Um, so, so right, these seem like very opposing ideas, right? That on the one hand, I'm saying we regret the things that we could have done differently, and now we're stuck, we have no opportunity. And then on the other hand, we regret the things where we do have opportunity. So how is it possible that researchers have found both of these? And it turns out the time course matters. Regret changes over time. Um, so this is actually research that I did at Miami University. Um, so I was talking about with my undergraduates, so you know, this is a really important question, how regret changes over time. But it's really hard to measure. Because how do you go out and know when somebody's about to experience regret and be there to catch them as it happens, and that it's something that they actually care about, you know, so that they're going to keep feeling regret over time. Um, obviously, ethically, we can't bring people into the lab and have terrible things happen to them, or make terrible things happen to them. You know, so, so this is just a real challenge to us as researchers, to, to find, you know, to know when someone's about to experience regret. And one of my undergraduates pipes up and says, what, you mean besides sorority recruitment? <laughs> and I said, oh, tell me more. Um, and so we went out and we recruited um, about 250 women who were going through sorority recruitment. Um, and we got them in the first three days after bid day when they find out if they got into a sorority, and if so, which one. Um, and they have a lot of feelings about this. I've been told by my undergraduates there's a lot of crying um, at bid day, both happy and sad. Um, and so we asked them um, about you know, sort of how do you feel about how bid day turned out for you? How much regret do you have about this? But then also, what were your goals in joining a sorority? And do you still feel like you can meet that? So, you know, some women say, well, you know, I wanted to be in this particular sorority because I have a family history with it. You know, my mom was in it, my sisters were in it. I really want to be part of this family tradition. Um, and I didn't get in, and now that's gone. I'm never going to be able to do that. Versus some other women say, well, I really wanted to join a sorority because I wanted to develop as a leader. I wanted to broaden my social circles. And yeah, I still think that there are other opportunities for me at Miami to do those things. Um, and so it turns out that lost opportunities affected how much regret people felt at first. So the women who said, I can never meet the goals I had, felt terrible. And the women who said, yeah, I probably still have some chance to meet these goals, didn't feel quite as bad at first. However, generally speaking, over time, regret decreased, which is a good thing. But it decreased a lot more if you didn't have future opportunity. So the more opportunity you thought you had, the more your regret stuck around. It didn't fade as fast. So again, the women who wanted to be in the same sororities as their moms and sisters, they got over it pretty quickly. Whereas the women who said, yeah, I wanted to become a leader, and I've missed my opportunity to do this, it persisted for longer. So that actually, we, we tracked them over the course of three months. We had them report back in two, months, two weeks later, a month later, two months later, three months later at the end of the semester. And after three months, there was actually a crossover that the people who said they had more opportunity now felt worse than the people who said they didn't have opportunity. So both of these theories are actually right. It just depends on what you're looking at. Is it initial regret, or is it on how regret is going to change over time? So I've talked a lot about where regret comes from in general, but are there individual differences in regret? Right? We know some people who say, oh, I don't believe in regret. Um, I tell those people, it's not Santa Claus. You don't have a choice. Um, but but there, are, there are individual differences in how likely people are to feel regret. Um, and there are some that it, there's actually a measure of regret proneness of just how much people 
think about what might have been. But there are other elements of our decision-making styles that can influence how much regret we feel. Yeah? Does this have anything to do with whether people tend to be optimists or pessimists? Is it glass half full, glass half empty, and I regret that I didn't drink more? <laughs> So in terms of the sort of that general outlook, I, I'm not specifically familiar with anything directly looking at optimism and pessimism. We'll talk a little bit about some of the benefits of regret that would make me say, I don't know, and given how important future opportunity is, the, the optimist who says, you know, the glass is, I have a lot of opportunity here, the glass is half full of opportunity, if that's a thing, um, may actually feel as much regret as the pessimist, but I think it's probably for different reasons, right? The optimist may actually be sort of thinking about, wow, you know, I sort of have all this hope about how great things could be, and so I see more gaps between where I am and this wonderful possible future I see for myself. You know, whereas pessimists may think, well, this is about as good as it gets. Um, but on the other hand, they're probably more aware of some of the negatives in their situation. Um, so, you know, it's an empirical question, and but you know, and I don't have the data to speak to it. But I think it's a, it, it's certainly I could see it going either way, actually. There, there's a there's a study for me, yeah. A study. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will have to take notes on that. So, in terms of some of the other individual differences, um, one of the big ones that we know um, is something called maximizing and satisfying. So I know you will promise no quizzes, but you're going to take a quiz. Um, and the font is really small here, um, so I can read this out. So just sort of keep track of how many of these you're sort of generally agreeing with um, versus disagreeing with. Okay, so number one, when I watch TV, I channel surf, scanning through available options, even if I'm trying to watch one program. Number two, when I'm in the car listening to the radio, I'll check other stations to see if something better is playing, even if I'm happy with what I'm listening to. Number three, I treat relationships like clothing. I expect to try a lot on before I get the perfect fit. Um, think back before you met your lovely spouse uh, for this question. Um, number four, no matter how satisfied I am with my job, it's right for me to be on the lookout for better opportunities. Number five, I fantasize about living in ways that are quite different from my actual life. Number six, I'm a fan of lists that attempt to rank things, the best movies, the best novels, etc. Number seven, no matter what I do, I have the highest standards for myself. Number eight, I never settle for second best. Number nine, whenever I'm faced with a choice, I try to imagine what all the other possibilities are, even ones that aren't present at the moment. And 10, I find that writing is difficult, even just a letter to a friend, because it's hard to word things just right. I often do several drafts of simple things. OK, so you have sort of generally, if you were agreeing with most of those or disagreeing with most of those. So the more items that you agreed with, the more of a maximizer that you are. And Maximizers are people who have a decision strategy of trying to go out and find the single best option that's available to them. Whereas satisficers, so if you were disagreeing with more of these items, you're more of a satisficer. And satisficing is a strategy where you set a threshold for yourself, and then you choose the first thing that meets that standard. So, if you're thinking about going car shopping, you set your budget, you set, you know, okay, what's the minimum mileage I'd accept um, in terms of fuel economy, what are the features I absolutely need, and the first car I find that's within my budget that has the mileage I want and has whatever particular bells and whistles interest me, that's the car I'm going to buy because it's good enough. And it turns out, well, I, I'm going to turn this over to you. Who do you think is happier with their decisions? Satisficers? Excellent. That is exactly true. The ironic thing is maximizers objectively, when we sort of have a, a truly best choice that we can set up in the lab, maximizers actually do better. Objectively, they choose the right thing. Satisficers are happier, though. Um, and in part, this is because right, we talked about this idea of regret being based on counterfactuals, these comparisons to what might have been. And maximizers have a lot more comparisons that they can be making, right? Because they're trying to look for the single best possible thing. So every time they come across something new, they have to say, well, this, would this have been better? 
versus satisficers aren't trying to do that, right? They're just trying to say, does it meet my standard? So they don't have to make these comparisons every time they come across something new, right? Nothing has changed. They're still at the standard they set for themselves. So they're actually much happier and much less likely to feel regret about their choices. So we've talked about what regret is, what we regret, why we regret it, and a little bit about individual differences. But so what? What are the consequences of regret? And I think a lot of people are aware of the idea that regret maybe isn't so good. Um, right? Again, this idea of living life without regrets suggests that regret is something we want to avoid. And in fact, there are obvious downsides to regret. Um, and particularly, we've looked at this in terms of mental health. So we do know that regret is associated with depression and anxiety. Um, and in particular, regret is associated with these things when it's involved with something called ruminative thinking. Um, so I don't know if anyone here took a lot of zoology classes as an undergrad. Um, so cows digest via rumination, um, where they actually regurgitate their food. This is what ruminative thinking is, literally vomiting back up your thoughts, chewing them over again and again and again and again. Um, and it's an unpleasant image, and it's actually a really unpleasant phenomenon. Um, the, it, it's unproductive, it's intrusive, it's repetitive. So continuing to think about something in a productive way and getting something new out of it isn't ruminative thinking. Right? Sometimes it takes a while to process something or really understand what's going on. That's not rumination. Rumination is where you're no longer getting anything out of it. You're just having it again. And particularly, it's, it's intrusive. It feels like something you don't really want to th think about, but you can't help yourself. Um, and ruminative regret is the really bad stuff. That regret, when you can't help yourself but thinking about it, it keeps coming back up again and again and again. That's what's really associated with general, um, sorry, with depression and anxiety. However, I have in the corner, but. So have any of you taken a psych class and know what I'm about to say? That this is correlational evidence, and we know correlation is not causation. I tell my undergraduates, if, I, if they were nothing else from me, if I can convince them over the course of the semester that correlational data is not causal, um, that that's the one thing to take away. So you can forget everything else I've said, but this one point, correlation, not causation. So we're not entirely clear, given the nature of the evidence that we have, whether it's the case that ruminative regret is causing depression and anxiety or if it's a symptom of depression and anxiety, and those disorders are causing people to have these maladaptive thoughts. Um, so we know they're associated, but we don't know which way that association necessarily works. So all of that's sort of a, a bummer about regret. Um, so why would I tell you, but don't go out and say I'm gonna live life without regret. It turns out there are a number of benefits of regret. Um, one of the benefits of regret that we're currently really interested in investigating is the idea that regret may actually help us be socially closer to other people. Um, so I've done work where we asked people uh, about the benefits of a lot of different negative emotions. Um, regret, anger, fear, sadness. Um, and one of the really fascinating things is that across all sorts of functions, so learning from our mistakes, um, doing better in the future, helping to understand ourselves, feeling closer to other people, people see regret as being better for them than these other negative emotions. Um, and social closeness is a really interesting one because people say that they think regret makes them feel closer to other people, but scientists really haven't spent a lot of time thinking about regret as a social emotion. Um, we've actually, in my lab, just recently started doing some research thinking about regret as a social emotion. Um, so at the end of 2011, there was um, on Twitter a hashtag that was trending um, that was 2011 regrets. Um, 
So as a regret researcher, I said, huh, that's interesting. Um, so we compiled 15,000 tweets that contained the hashtag 2011 regrets. Um, and I got 22 undergraduates to spend the next six weeks coding them on 40 different dimensions. Um, they agreed about 97% of the decisions they made. Um, but if you do the math on that, that means there were 6,000 things they disagreed about. And my graduate student, um, sat down and spent six weeks of his life resolving 6,000 discrepancies. Um, speaking of regret. Um, <laughs> but one of the really fascinating things that happened in those tweets was that the patterns of what people were reporting as the areas of life that they were experiencing regret about weren't the same as what I told you earlier. Right? They weren't talking about their education. They weren't talking about their career. They weren't talking about their finances. They were talking about their social relationships. They were talking, um, above all else, about a third of the tweets related to their romantic relationships. Um, and then a lot of them, um, the second most common, were things where they were clearly talking about some social relationship, but we couldn't tell what. Um, you know, that I wish I hadn't. Um, yelled at her. So it's sort of unclear, is she a sister? Is she a friend? Is she a girlfriend? We don't know. Um, yeah? Isn't this though more age related? I mean, the number of people that are tweeting among the 70 year olds, clearly the percentage that the number of tweeters in their 20s is. Yes, so, so that's absolutely true, and we think it certainly explains some of this. Um, it's, it, Twitter actually is not quite as young as you might think. Um, it, it's certainly skewed young, but there are a lot of uh, Twitter users in their 30s, 40s, even 50s. Um, so, you know, again, certainly the age-related differences you know, could explain a lot of this. Um, but one of the other things, that, so we've gone, because of this, um, gone out and done research using not just um, Twitter, but um, going onto Amazon actually has a, a website, Mechanical Turk, which is um, a new uh, oh, <laughs> tweeters. Um, um, the, uh, and so we've gone out and recruited sort of a larger age sample um, to do some of the sort of experimental work. And that actually, um, we find that what really matters is that sharing regret with other people seems to make us feel closer. Um, that when we compare regrets that people say, I've thought about it privately, they say, that's really useful for the next benefit I'm going to tell you about. But talking about it with other people makes me feel closer to others. So we're still trying to figure out, well, maybe this is just anytime you tell somebody something that's sort of private and secret, and regrets, I think, are among our biggest secrets, maybe that's part of it. Some of this may be that people are using regret as a form of apology. Um, so we're still sort of unpacking why it is that regret makes us feel closer to other people. But it seems to. The big benefit that we know about for regret, though, is learning. Regret is a powerful, powerful teacher. Um, so if you think about counterfactual thoughts, right, these if-only thoughts, they're actually really important in causal reasoning. right? So if I say, um, you know, if only I had been a better communicator in my last relationship, maybe we wouldn't have broken up. But I've identified a cause for that breakup. It was communication. And it wasn't any of these other things. Right? If I say, you know, if only I had pl served better, mood, better, mood, better food at my last party, then it would have been more successful. Right? Then I've identified the food as the reason that the party wasn't very successful versus if only I had invited more interesting people or had uh, more comfortable furniture or better music. or right? There are lots of things that might have made a party more successful. Um, and this is really going to influence how I act in the future. So we know that giving people counterfactual thoughts about if only I had done this, then things would have turned out better makes them faster at identifying that as an intention that they're going to perform in the future. So in the future, I will hire a caterer instead of trying to cook everything myself, for instance, at my parties. Um, so it helps us make future plans. And this may explain this opportunity effect that I told you about earlier. 
right? If regret is helping us learn from our mistakes, then it's really useful that it's sticking around in exactly the places where we have future opportunities to do better. So again, if I feel like, you know, I, if our undergraduate students, if I think I've got a lot of opportunities to do better in my education, thinking about, huh, you know, I really regret that I went uptown the night before that big midterm exam. In the future, a little more time at King, a little less time at Brick Street the night before my exam. Things may go better. That's a really important lesson. That's when we want them to learn as soon as they possibly can, really. Um, so learning is really a big, big benefit of regret. So. We've talked about a lot of stuff today. We've talked about what regret is, where it comes from, how it changes over time, some of the downsides, and also some of the benefits. And I think if there's one take home message here, it's that regret is both a common emotion and a really, really useful one. Um, I sometimes compare it to physical pain. Right? If you know that there are some kids who are born with a disorder where they can't feel pain, and very few of them survive to adolescence, because pain is actually a really important signal. You put your hand on a hot stove, you need there to be a signal, hey, get away from this as fast as you can, it's going to hurt you. And regret is sort of our mind doing the same thing for us. Hey, this was a stupid mistake, don't do that again in the future, you're gonna get hurt. Um, so listening to regret's lessons but then letting go and moving on and not ruminating, um, regret can really be a very good thing for us. So that's what I have. Thank you guys so much, and I'm happy to answer any more questions. You just said something right there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's an old expression that uh, pain has no memory. Hmm. You know, that hot stove, you, you really don't remember. We've all had operations or whatever that be. You don't remember pain. But you're saying that you really and truly remember a regret and can learn by it? Yeah. Is it really universally true? Yes, and so I would say, I would actually dispute the saying a little bit because um, we may not remember it, and I'll talk about this actually, I'm gonna sort of preview my class tomorrow morning a little bit, um, that, that there's sort of a couple of ways we can learn things. We can learn facts and we can learn associations. And I would say, Pain is something that we learn in a really associative way. So if you think about rats in a cage, right? We can condition them um, that you know a bell plays and they get shocked. And this is something that you only have to do this a few times before they will start flinching every time they hear that tone. Um, and I think that pain is the same way. That um, you know that we only have to have something painful happen to us once or twice. Um, I know personally, I got pounced by a dog when I was, a friendly dog, but I got knocked flat on my back on concrete and I was terrified of dogs for years because pain is a powerful teacher. That I know dog, really upsetting situation, bam, I'm scared of dogs. Um, fear conditioning is one of the most powerful things we can learn. So I think that, again, it's, it's not necessarily the case that I'm consciously gonna think about and remember these things, but that there is this association that I'm getting um, and that, that both in terms of physical pain and psychological pain. Um, a, a totally separate thing is that, but just really cool and something I always like telling people, is um, social pain and physical pain actually seem to use the same system. Um, if we reject people, it actually activates the exact same centers in the brain as physical pain. Um, and if we give people um, Advil that blocks pain receptors, um, this actually um, makes people not feel as bad after rejection. Um, so I actually have a handful of colleagues who I want to identify who like take an Advil before they have to give a big talk at a conference or go to a cocktail party where they're really nervous um, because it actually affects the, the brain systems involved in perceiving social rejection. So totally unrelated to your question, but just a cool fact about the way the mind works. Um, That's nice so. to know. Yeah. Um, everyone's running back to the room and taking Advil. Um, <laughs> but, um, other Does questions? Does it work with other painkillers? Um, it actually, it doesn't work with every, it's, it's specifically, um, it has to be the kind that blocks substance P and not 
um, like Tylenol that's an anti-inflammatory, I think doesn't work. Because they work in different ways. I, this is where I get out of my pay grade, but um, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that it has to be ibuprofen and not some of the other um, acetaminophen. I think doesn't work. Right. I take ibuprofen because I now have to give myself an injection three times a week, so I take it before I get the injection, so I don't feel the pain. Yeah. You're probably also like having a much smoother functioning social life without even realizing it. So, <laughs> side effect benefits. I'm not about it. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Any other questions I can answer? What are you going to be researching on this subject in the future? So, I think that this question of how regret changes over time is really, really an interesting one, um, and not a place we've done a lot of research in part because of this difficulty of catching regret right as it happens, um, and in part because the statistics that you need to do to understand change over time require fairly heavy computing that you know even a decade ago um, you know, was something you had to go to a university computing center for, and now anybody's laptop top can do. Um, so you know, I'm hoping that that's going to be a direction I go. Um, I actually have a grant pending at the National Science Foundation, but um, with federal funding being what it is right now. Um, if you want to know what happens next, call your congressman. <laughs> yeah. In your research, you must have run into people who say, I have no regrets. Uh, what, what is too your young to have known Edith Piaf. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard, I've heard, I, I, I never met her, but uh, yeah. Um, so there certainly are people um, who who say that. One of the things we do when we ask people about regret is we don't actually ever use the word regret because a lot of people have sort of this philosophy, I have no regrets. Um, but when you tell people, a lot of times when bad things happen, we think about how things could have been better. Do you have any of those kinds of thoughts? Most people can identify those thoughts. Um, it, it does seem to be, actually one of the things in the Twitter study was about 10% of the tweets that we got that contained this 2011 regrets hashtags um, it said, I don't have regret or I don't believe in regret. Um, one of the really interesting things on Twitter was actually that um, those people oftentimes were talking about a, a sense of fate or divine purpose in their life. Um, that, you know, so, you know, it's all God's plan and I have no regrets. Um, and so, it may be the case that those people are having the same kind of counterfactual thoughts. Things could have been different, things could have been better, but they're not necessarily focusing them on the self. Well, you know, th this was fate, this was God, and it wasn't, there's nothing I could have done to attain a different outcome. This is what was planned for me, this is what was meant to be, and I'm not going to question it. Um, you know, and so sort of understanding what are the consequences of having that. Um, and we do know that counterfactual thoughts actually are involved in perceiving fate. Um, so if I tell you a story about two people who meet on a subway, um, people who are told that they sat across from each other on the subway and one of them had rushed for the doors and just gotten on board as the doors were closing, and then they sat down and struck up this conversation and fell in love, yada yada, um, see the relationship is more fated and meant to be than people who are told um, you know, that he was waiting on the platform as the train arrived, sat down with plenty of time, um, and then they started talking, um, even though right, that's really not relevant. Um, so, so we know that fate and counterfactual thinking are, are pretty tied in people's minds. So I think that that's one of the places that people maybe t have these same kinds of thoughts, but they take them in a very different direction in terms of who's responsible for them and what that means. Yeah. So that is really my, my colleagues over in clinical psychology in terms of how to handle that. Um, I know that you know, one of the things that's a really new therapy is actually um, sort of coming out of the idea of um, mindfulness and meditation. Um, so being aware that I'm experiencing this thought and not judging it or trying to control it and just sort of 
letting it be and then letting it pass um, seems to be, for some of these intrusive thoughts, actually a really effective strategy. But um, I'm a little, I don't want to speak too much about that because I'm a little out of my depth in terms of what sort of the state of clinical psychology is right now. Yes. So th that, we're actually, we're not doing that study. We're doing a very similar study in the lab right now. So um, again, this is, I, I need to come here and get all of my research ideas from you guys. Um, the, um, I don't know about age-related changes in that. Um, there's some evidence that sort of just based on how long it's been since a regrettable incident, um, that if I ask you to think about something from more than a year ago that you regret, you're more likely to tell me about something you didn't do. And if I ask you to tell me about something recent, you're more likely to tell me something you did. Um, so that seems to be a trend. Um, we're actually right now trying to look at every study that has ever compared what we call actions and inactions um, and sort of aggregate them together and say, OK, which one do we regret? And can we identify when it's one and when it's the other? So does, one of the things that seems to matter um, is sort of what's happened before this incident. So um, if I tell you about a coach where they've, they lost their last big game, um, and then he played the same starters as the previous game, and they lost again, everybody thinks that's way worse than he changed the starters, and they lost again. Um, because it seems normal after a failure, you ought to change something, and so you should feel less regret. Again, going back to this idea about is it normal, is it unusual? Um, so that seems to change things. Time seems to change things. Um, so there, there's sort of a lot of stuff going on, and we're actually right now, um, literally I've got two undergraduates and a grad student back in Oxford feverishly typing on this very subject. So. Do you find that people who express regret are doing so because they need justification for feeling the way they do. Interesting. Um, so, sort of like, sort of like trying to like the with, with the folks who are tweeting it. The oh yeah. The tweeting it is because they need reaffirmation that they are actually more right. So therefore, they 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 need to express it. Yeah, so th there's actually a lot of the work on social media right now in emotional expression is looking at exactly that, this idea of, you know, are you sort of trying to get other people to respond back to you in certain ways. Um, I actually have a, a colleague at Miami um, who studies women with eating disorders, um, which doesn't sound like it's relevant, but it is, um, where the women who go online and will talk about their eating and, you know, oh my gosh, I totally binged on those brownies, I'm so fat and disgusting, um, and doing it really as a strategy for other people to tell them, you know, no, you're totally skinny, um, you know, so that that's one of the things. Um, there's also a relationship between self-esteem and what people post online. Um, so high self-esteem people tend to have really positive um, Facebook content in particular, is what's, what they've looked at. Um, but when they do post something negative, they get that. They get that sort of reassurance. You know, people will say, you know, oh, I'm so sorry you're upset. Oh, no, hang in there. Um, yeah, and the, the really interesting thing is that low self-esteem people post a lot more negative stuff and they get, they're the boy who cried wolf, right? That they, they are always talking about how terrible things are and they get a lot less positive feedback in response to it um, because, you know, the, people are sort of overwhelmed with the amount of negative content and they're not as supportive. Um, so I think, you know, we're still sort of trying to understand that social media is way ahead of the, the research on it, but I think that's a, a really, that seems to be what's going on for sure. Frank Sinatra right then in his song. Chief, you to mention? I have a few, but I did it my way, so that's <laughs> is he right? Do you have the right idea? You know, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, you know, I, and I think that that is, you know, the, the idea that, you know, every choice we made is part of how we got to where we are, um, you know, I, I think is an important idea. Well, thank you guys again so much, and I'm happy to talk more this weekend.
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So who do you think makes um, a better couple? A maximizer with a satisfier <laughs> or two maximizers or two satisfiers? Huh. Uh, two satisfiers. I, I, I would definitely two say two. that, uh, yeah, two, two maximizers are probably uh, not uh, a good match. Um, but, I, you know, and I, I, d I don't know. Because I think that the question is, right, in terms of like who makes a better couple is also what they do to themselves. So that if you have, in some ways, a maximizer and a satisficer, there could be benefits to that. On the other hand, there could be um, the, you know, right, if you sort of are at loggerheads because of these competing styles, that could really be, yeah. I mean, that could be the worst of all possible worlds. So I don't, I don't actually know that people have really brought over the sort of decision-making styles and relationship the researchers. Is always so the satisfiers, as long as they agree on the minimum. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would bet that they're probably the best off. Um, but yeah, the sort of which one is worse, the the, the mixed marriage or the two maximizers, is it's an interesting empirical question. Never talk to her against her. people who believe in fate, predestination, mm -hmm. but they're in like very much sex. Don't they so tend to be more satisfiers and less maximizers? I think I I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, again, I, it's an interesting empirical question, and I, I don't know that anyone has looked at those two things together. Um, let, me, let me go one step further. I, I lived for many years in a Muslim country. OK. And they are definitely believers in faith. God, yeah. everything is done by God's will. I found very few maximum. Hmm. Well, okay. You know, I, it, it's certain intuitively, uh, like that seems like it would ha that that would have to be the case that, you know, that, that if you if you see sort of the divine or fate or whatever as the thing that's really causal, then, you know, I, I feel like actually one, one thing I probably should have mentioned is that a lot of this is based on American or Western participants, and some of this stuff really operates differently. So one of the the most classic things we know, yeah, yeah. So so cognitive dissonance is this really well established thing we know about from the 50s that if I make you make a choice, um, that you'll start doing things to justify that decision, and it doesn't happen in East Asian cultures. The only way we get post-decisional dissonance is if I tell you you're choosing for a friend or a friend is choosing for you. Both of those things will make you justify your actions, but choosing for yourself, the idea that you're supposed to have stable preferences and act in accordance with them isn't part of the cultural mindset. So, you know, a lot of this really is based on a particular worldview where, yeah, you are a causal agent and the self is central, so. Is a maximizer, are alphas always maximizers? Mm -hmm. Again, I, you know, I, or is that too em broad? empirically, I don't, I don't know that anybody's looked at that. I would, I think that it's, I, I, would, I would imagine that there's a relationship between those things, um, but I don't, yeah, I mean, I, 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 intuitively I would agree with that, but I don't know for sure that that's absolutely the case. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that it seems like remorse has more of a moral implication or perhaps exactly. yeah. it involves either lack of empathy or something like that. Whereas regret just between you and you. Like, oh, I feel, I feel regret that I didn't make this decision. Yeah. But, but that remorse seems like it's in some other more difficult kind of uh, yeah. place. I, mean, I was thinking about how yeah. judges want and it's just, offenders it's to feel remorse. remorse. Yeah. But That's they don't use the word regret. Yeah. Because they could regret that they, they got in, they got in trouble. Yeah. But that's different than than remorse. remorse. Yeah. That's I interesting. Wonder, I wonder if there are any studies that show moving from regret yeah, to remorse. Yeah. It's more mature. It'll never fix anything. You know, yeah, but that's... Or not more mature, that's not the word, that's not the word. No, I mean, I, I understand what you mean, that um, the... Uh, yeah. uh, so, it's interesting, remorse is actually not a word that comes up a lot in how, th these emotions. Um, people talk a lot, though, about um, sort of guilt and shame as well as regret, and those are, rather than thinking about 
what might have been in terms of sort of comparing where I am to sort of what I think could have been. Guilt and shame are based on sort of where, what did I do versus what are my sort of standards or rules or goals for myself. Um, and so I, I think that remorse maybe also involves this blend of regret and sort of guilt. So it's both that I, things could have been better and also that I sort of failed to meet my own standards for myself, you know, the, uh, of what you're saying, that there's sort of a moral failing here as well. An implication that without the remorse, there's less likely, there's more likely to be repeated regrets. Yeah. Yeah. Pointed out over the corner. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, I think you're right that, and some of this may also just be, you know, there's always a, a sort of some gap between you know how we're using it in the scientific literature and, and what we say in conversation. But I, you know, I think you're totally right that you know, that, yeah, regretting I got caught versus regretting what my crime yeah. did to these other people. Yeah, exactly. And, the, and regret really doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that that's, yeah, and, I th and it, it makes a lot of sense that why we should want, you know, the sort of empathy and the sort of personal responsibility, yeah. you know, from from offenders and not just the, yeah, things would have been better if something else had happened. Um, yeah. You did a nice so. job. Well, thank you so much. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you.